Okay, so welcome to this video on the law of total probability and random variables. So, the law of total probability, law of total probability and random variables. Okay, so we're going to start with discrete random variables because they are easier, and then we will go on to continuous random variables. And continuous random variables, it is fair to say, are get start to get difficult when you start considering problems like this, and you start having to tackle deep problems in analysis. Um, but uh, the reason we're going to um, we're going to look at a result here, and uh, the reason we're going to do it is that we will need it in the video that is uh, coming next, which is uh, on the Plasser's law rule of succession. Uh, so here goes. Uh, so for discrete random variables, the case is very very easy. Um, so discrete random variables. So we have some probability space, some abstract probability space here, being mapped onto a. Um, a set of uh, real numbers which is discrete so it's either you've either got finitely many or you've got countably infinitely many but you don't have uh, uncountably infinitely many you have a number that you can list uh, you can list them off basically Okay, uh, so you have uh, this function, and uh, basically, uh, if you recall from earlier videos, the law of total probability, law of total probability, total probability, the idea is that. Uh, if we have a set of events, so if we have uh, an abstract probability space here, uh, which is just some or en any old probability space you like, um, uh, omega curly f p, uh, then you can, if you have a partition of this set, so if you have some events e1, e2, etc., all the way on, uh, so we're going to have e3, etc. So we have uh, potentially count, uh, well, finitely many or potentially countably infinitely many onwards and the condition is that e i intersect e j has to be equal to the empty set i.e. Uh, they do not overlap whatsoever if you intersect any two of them uh, they're always equal to empty so for if i is not equal to j okay uh, so uh, pick any two and they do not intersect whatsoever then uh, if we want the probability of some other event let's say a is some event here if we want the probability of the event A, then what we can do is we can uh, split it up into the bits that are in each of these uh, in each of these um, little segments, each of these partitions. So here's a bit that's in a partition. Um, here's another bit that's in a different partition. This is in E2. Uh, and uh, have I got more colours? Uh, where did my highlighter go? Other oh, highlighter go? Ah, it's over there. Uh, and here. Is another element in e a bit in a uh, bit in e three. Uh, so basically, what we can do is we can split up. We can say that uh, the probability uh, of uh, the overall set A is equal to. Um, well, firstly, we can say we can firstly say that A is equal to the union, the disjoint union. J is equal to one, potentially to infinity of E J. And then what we can say is that the probability of A. Uh, sorry. E j um, intersect a. That should be not. It's not equal to the union of E j's. And the union of E j's is the entire space. So if you intersect a with E j, uh, what we say, what we, what this means is um, the bit of a that's in E in E j. So uh, this is the uh, a intersect e three. This is a intersect e two, and this is a intersect e one. Uh, so now what we can say is, if I just draw a line there to separate the two equations, that the probability of a is equal to the probability of this great big union. Union j is equal to one uh, to infinity e j intersection a. And then by the second axiom of probability, this is just equal to the sum j is equal to one uh, to infinity of the probability of e j intersect a. Okay. Uh, so uh, all we're doing there is the second using the second axiom of probability. Now uh, we know that the conditional probability, the probability of e1 intersect a, given e1 has occurred. So given that you're in the event e1, so you're viewing e1 now as your uh, your entire probability space, uh, and you're asking what is the probability of e1 in 
this new probability space, you're going to bump up the probability of E1 intersect A uh, in this uh, new probability space because it will have to be much smaller in the whole probability space. Uh, for instance, the E1 will have some probability in this original probability space. When you view E1 as the whole space, its probability is going to get bumped up to being 1. Uh, so all these sets within here are potentially going to get their probability bumped up. Well, they're all going to get their probability bumped up. So this is going to get its probability bumped up. Uh, and we could make E uh, the event arbitrary, so Ej, so this works for E1, E2, E3. It's equal to the probability of Ej intersect A um, uh, intersect Ej uh, given uh, that um, the probability, given that uh, probability, um, given that, uh, oh, yes, sorry, I should have said uh, the probability of A given EJ. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, I could have said EJ uh, intersect A, uh, but it's more common to see it written the probability of A given EJ, which is equal to the A intersect EJ uh, divided by the probability of EJ. That's better. It's exactly the same thing. Um, the probability of that the of the bit that intersects uh, um, the bit that intersects it given e one has occurred is exactly the same thing as the probability of the whole the whole event a uh, given that e one has occurred but uh, just um, to be conventional uh, let's make sure that uh, it is just a uh, so now what we can say is that uh, the probability of a intersect e j is actually equal to the probability of a given e j times the probability of Ej. And uh, then what we say is therefore, uh, since the probability of A is equal to this, we can say that the probability of A is equal to the sum, J is equal to 1 to infinity, and now just substitute in, uh, instead of putting the probability of Ej in set A, put this. Uh, the probability of A given Ej has occurred times the probability that Ej occurs in the first place. Okay, uh, so that's the law of total probability. Law of total probability. And now what we want to do is generalise that uh, so that it works for in, dis in the case of discrete random variables. So, uh, what we're now going to say is that uh, this discrete random variable can take on loads of different values. So uh, the discrete random variable has lots of different values. So say here's 1, here's 2, here's 4, here's 5. Each one of these has a corresponding event back here. Uh, so if we say x inverse of the set containing 1, uh, which means all elements of the original sample space, all little s is an element of the sample space, such that x of s, when you take uh, the uh, value s and you map it onto whatever value it goes into here, all uh, its value has to be equal to 1. So basically, uh, it 1 has a corresponding event back here, uh, which um, is its inverse, its pre-image, if you like. Rather, it's inverse. Don't say it's inverse. It's pre-image is the correct term, uh, because uh, x isn't necessarily bijective. It uh, could be... Um, it could be most definitely not bijective, uh, so it wouldn't doesn't necessarily have an inverse. But its pre-image is defined, and if x is a random variable, then by definition, uh, the pre-image of each set containing 1, 2, 3, etc., they all have to be uh, events in this uh, sample space, so they all have to be elements of uh, big curly f. Okay, uh, so uh, we can then uh, use these. Uh, we can use these sets uh, to partition up our sample space and apply the law of total probability on that. Uh, so let's do that. Okay. Uh, so uh, just to recall, we have a abstract probability space here being mapped onto uh, a discrete set of uh, real numbers over here by a discrete random variable x, and we are saying we can partition the set up. Uh, by the pre-images of the elements in here. Uh, so uh, this could be x inverse of, say, 1, uh, this set here. Uh, this one could be the x inverse of 2. And basically, every single element in this uh, sample space has to have been ascribed uh, ascribed a uh, real number in here. And it, indeed, it's ascribed only one real number in here. So it will, it will be in at least one of the inverse images, uh, and it uh, will only be in one. So it will be in at least one, and it will only be in one. So this is a well-defined uh, partition of the sample space. Uh, so now, if we apply the law of total probability, we can say that the probability of any event A is equal to the sum, um, the sum over, let's say, all values that x can take on, uh, so all little x 
of the probability of A given uh, that uh, given the events that x is equal to some uh, oh I should put big X big X is equal to some little x times the probability that big X is equal to little x. So basically that is exactly the same as what we did over here. Uh, you're just filling in the fact that the event ej ej now is going to become uh, let's say um, it's going to become the event uh, x inverse of some uh, should we say little j uh, and of course there are countably many j little j uh, because uh, it's a discrete random variable so the uh, the uh, set of things you are mapping onto has to have only countably many elements uh, so there are going to be uh, countably many of these um, inverse image events and then we're just timesing it by the probability of that event which is the probability that big x is equal to little x uh, so that's what that means basically so this is the PMF uh, of the random variable, and uh, this is some conditional probability. So this is how we can apply the law of total probability uh, with discrete random variables. In the next video, I'll show you how to do it for continuous random variables, and then we will apply it in uh, our discussion of uh, Laplace's uh, rule of succession.